We have the pleasure to have here today with us Dr. Rachel Howard of the University of Leeds. But before proceeding, before saying anything else, I hope to thank one of our graduate students, in particular, Nicolò Salmaso, for having alerted me about Dr. Howard's latest book and for having gotten in touch with her to check her availability for today's presentation. So, grazie Nicolò for all the work you have done and thank you also, Lucia, for helping today as well. Um, Dr. Hayworth is a well-known scholar of 20th century Italian popular music, media and culture, focusing on questions of stardom, gender, performance and value in the Italian pop music context. She has published books and articles on French and Italian singers, songwriters of the 1960s and 70s, on social celebrity scandals, as well as Italian variety television. She is the author of From the Chanson Francaise to the Canzone d'Autore in the 1960s and 70s, Authenticity, Authority and Influence, an excellent book, I would like to add, that shows the passages and transformations of songwriting from the French sources to the Italian, perhaps slightly more politicized context, and of several works on the iconic Italian singer Mina. Today, she will discuss with us her most recent book on Mina, precisely, published a few months ago, The Many Meanings of Mina, Popular Music Stardom in Post-War Italy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard to Indiana University, if only virtually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And um, thank you as well, Nicola, in particular, for all the hard work you've done behind the scenes and keeping me informed. I appreciate it. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. If somebody in the room in there wants to give me a nice a thumbs up, that's great. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So everything is working. The next challenge will be to see if I can share my screen because I have some slides and some photographs and also I'm hoping a couple of video clips to share with you. So fingers crossed this will work and we won't know if the sound works until we get there. And if it doesn't, I promise I won't sing. So it will be fine. So thank you, like I say, for the invitation to talk to you today about some of the work then that I've been doing on the many meanings of Mina, that Italian popular music diva. So in case any of you have not heard of Mina, who is she? Well, Mina, or full name Anna Maria Mazzini, born Lombardy 1940, is an Italian popular music icon, I think. And she's had a 60 year long career and throughout that process then she's come to represent a whole host of diverse meanings. She is one of the best loved pop stars in Italy. She also has a massive fan base across Europe, Asia, South America as well. Her career began in the late 1950s, it kind of peaked in the 60s and 70s, but despite the fact she retired from public appearances at the end of the 1970s, she continues to be popular and successful today. She keeps releasing new albums, they consistently debut at the number one spot in the Italian charts. But I think she's interesting as well because she shows us you know, how stardom gets constructed by and through different media. And that's because, yes, she's a pop star, but she was also, um, she's also been a film star. She's a television personality. Um, she's advertised different Italian brands on TV, and she's been a magazine writer and an agony aunt. So her star persona is kind of the product of all these intersections and interactions of the different mediums with which she's been involved. And I'll talk a little bit about my use of the word medium in a moment. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about how we can read stars like Mina as intermediums. And that idea of intermediality then suggests a kind of creative space where new meanings of the star can be generated precisely when media forms intersect. And then I want to apply that to two case studies. Um, and these are two examples of mediums that have been important to Mina's career and, and to her significance. The, we're going to start with popular music genres, the urlo, the rock and roll genre, and the canzone all'italiana, that traditional Italian song form. And then I'm going to look at TV advertising. 
which in the case of Mina is um, looking at when she became the face of Bari La Pasta in TV adverts in the 1960s. So let's start with kind of a broad question. Why does it matter what pop stars actually mean? Well, that kind of question maybe gets us thinking about a broader discussion around why music actually matters. And scholar David Hesman Holsch can help here a little bit because he explains that the importance of music and its value in society is bound up with its ability to provide a means for constructing and expressing self and collective identities. And yes, he says, as you can see in the quote on screen, all cultural products have this potential, but maybe music is particularly powerful because of its link to emotions and feelings. Now that maybe starts to tell us why pop stars matter. If we accept that music informs and shapes senses of personal and collective identity, then we can see pop stars as the embodiment of these identities and their associated values within their respective societies. So stars can start to reveal a lot about the society and culture that they come from. And that's what Stephen Gundel argues about the Italian context, specifically when he suggests that Italy's stars offer, quote, a significant way of reading Italian society and culture. And that's because of their function as a cultural symbol and conduit for ideas about, as you can see on screen, gender, values and national identity. But I think we can also add things like ways of behaving, dominant ideologies, social and cultural status quo. So stars embody a specific set of meanings and connotations that reveal something about the systems of cultural value and wider established ideologies and ways of working that actually exist within Italian society. And I think Mina is a really good case in point. So that's kind of why pop stars, why Mina, why should we be interested? But thinking a little bit about how you pin down what a star means, well, What's the process that they go through to actually kind of come to mean what they mean? Well, scholar Richard Dyer talks about the star image or star meaning as being made out of media texts that can be grouped together as promotion, publicity, films, criticism and commentaries. To explain that, promotion is text that get deliberately created to um, give you a particular image of a particular star. Publicity then is what the press finds out or what the star lets slip. Criticism commentaries obviously is what's said or written about the star by critics and writers. Film is important for Dyer because he's looking at film stars. So maybe in the context of pop stars, we can think about music, but also the other media in which the pop star performs. But what happens then in terms of kind of creating meaning is that we actually need to look at how all of the media texts blend together to produce that star image, which thanks to this blending becomes kind of an, an image in its own right. It becomes a totality. And building on Richard Dyer's work, then Stephen Lowry explains how important this blending is, because he argues, as you can see on screen, stardom isn't particularly this more or less unified entity, but it's an intersection of different systems. So actually, star images we need to look at as points of intersection in multiple processes. So star image, star meaning, uh, get produced by the intersections of different texts, intertexts and contexts. And it's that idea of kind of intersection that for me is so important. So my aim is to examine the intersection of processes to start to think about what Mina means as a star. So that means thinking about her intermediately and identifying and analysing how all of these different mediums she's involved with interact, intersect and blend as a way of understanding then what she comes to signify. And that kind of approach is useful when you actually look at her career and I've kind of tried to visually represent it on this slide um, but you can start to realise just kind of how many mediums she's been involved with. Now all of these have given her her fans access um, to her but they've also influenced then the type of star she would become as well as the meanings that she embodies and the reason I use medium is I'm referring more to that means of perception understanding dispersion distribution and the forms or modes of communication 
that have shaped me in a star status and significance. So I don't, I'm not using media because I think that might be a bit confusing because that might mean the mass media. And actually I don't always mean that here. So you can see on screen some of those means of perception, understanding, distribution, communication that have influenced me in as development as star. Um, I haven't got time to talk about all of them today. So we're just gonna talk about some of the music she's done and some of those adverts. So identifying and analyzing those mediums and how they intersect and interact is fundamental for me to interpreting the many meanings of Mina. And that's why I'm kind of thinking about intermediality. Um, and it, for me, I've used it almost as a model um, to try to kind of analyze then what actually is happening when Mina gets involved with all of these different things during her career. The framework acknowledges how important the medium is, but it also allows me to think about what happens when these mediums intersect with one another, because there is a creative potential of an intersection, an in-between space. And that's what's picked up on screen by those two scholars, Chaplin Kattenbelt, who've worked on intermediality in theatre. So you can see they think intermediality, they think of intermediality as this moment of, of kind of intersection where different forms interact and integrate to produce these kind of spaces in between. And they argue ultimately that that in-between is kind of that creative space. What that means then is intersections of media provide an intermediate space that encourage the exchangeability of expressive means and aesthetic conventions and the production then of new meanings. So that's kind of why I'm using intermediality. I appreciate this bit's a bit theoretical, but I just thought I need to explain to you how I'm trying to think about what happens when Mina gets involved with all of the things that she does. The other useful thing about thinking about intermediality in the context of theatre is that it can help us think about Mina as an intermedium then. So she's the product of all these intersections of mediums when new meanings get produced actually through that process of exchange and interaction. In a way, she is the stage upon which these mediums intersect and interact. She is the site where media texts blend and new meanings get produced. And the thing that's really kind of interesting with Mina is she transcends her original medium of, a pop mu of popular music. She's not just a pop star. And you can see on screen some of those kinds of lenses or mediums that can help us to understand her. Her resultant status of star in Italian popular culture has the power to reveal the values and ideals that shape and govern 20th and 21st century Italy, I think, thanks to her involvement then in so many mediums. So it's this light in which I read the many meanings of Mina and which I'm going to try and illustrate now to you with two examples. So first example, let's start, well, let's start at the beginning. Let's start in 1958, when Mina becomes established as a popular music star. And she kind of becomes that star really thanks to her involvement with these two prominent pop music genres. So Urla, Italy's version of rock and roll, and Canzone all'Italiana, so Italy's kind of traditional melodic song. These are the mediums that initially will shape Mina's star significance in the early years of her career. Now, both of these song forms are really popular in Italy at the end of the 50s. To explain a little bit about rock and roll, that arrived in Italy in 1954, but actually Urlo isn't just an equivalent of American rock and roll. Rather, I think it's more a translation into Italian culture of that American genre. And the translation kind of doesn't water down or domesticate the original. Rather, it emerges from a very specific Italian context, which is marked by different musical, ethnic, political, linguistic and religious experiences. So Urlo is something different. It's something Italian. The music draws on forms and rhythms and models from other musical cultures, and notably um, that of the US. Um, and it represents then a break with the traditional melodic song form that really re kind of represented quintessential Italian popular songs of the period. Um, that's the genre that's probably best represented at, uh, um, in the 50s by the San Remo Festival, which you've probably heard of. Um, established in 1951, 
that festival quickly became a benchmark for all Italian popular music, and it played an important role in conceptualizing the canzone all'italiana as the canzone all'italiana. It showcased certain types of songs, specific melodies, specific rhythmic approaches, certain types of lyrics. So by 1958, when Mina comes on the scene, the way the media talked about these two genres of music actually resulted in Urlo being perceived as the direct opposite to the Canzone all'Italiana. The Canzone all'Italiana was traditional, it was safe, it was, as the name suggests, Italian. Urlo was kind of other, not Italian, it was modern, it was dangerous. It was a symbol of the younger generation in Italy. Now, when Mina bursts on the stage in 1958, she is an urlatrice, a rock and roller. So newspaper reviews, as you can see on screen, talk about her being this little girl with short hair, frenetic rhythm, superb voice. She is this real revelation. She's, look, modern again, so young, enthusiastic. She's innovative. She drives the public wild. She is <clears throat> possessed by rock and roll rhythms. And so she's one of the best performers of this new type of music that's taking Italy by storm. That modernity is really visible in Mina's first live performance on Italian TV, and that took place in 59. She appears on Il Musichiere, which is like a, a quiz show where the contestants get blindfolded and they have to identify the guest singers from just listening to their voice. I'm hoping this will work. This is the clip then of Mina's performance. Here we go. Again, if you can give me a thumbs up in the room, if you can hear the audio. I'll pause her there. I feel bad pausing her, but I'm going to have to pause her there. So let me kind of explain what we've just seen. She steps out, obviously, from behind the jukebox, which is, again, a, a kind of visual symbol of, of that modern music. And you get that melody then starting and then the drums join in. And as they join in, she begins, she begins to dance. And did you notice she moves her whole body? You know, I mean, I know it's quite staid in comparison to some dancing now, but you've got arms going, you've got feet tapping. She does sway from side to side. And when she sings, there's that doubling up of notes that comes from how she pronounces the U, um, which she kind of says twice. And I don't know how she manages it. And I'm going to attempt it because she sort of says, Ness Una, and she kind of says the U twice. Ness and it, in a way, it kind of accelerates that sense of rhythm in the song which then is obviously underscored by the way she performs it because she's bobbing along, she's swaying, she's tapping her foot. She uses her whole body to kind of punctuate that 4-4 four, four beat. And then obviously we have the hands. It's a perfect pause there actually with the hands up. You know, she's, she scores the melody with her hands. She emphasizes how she's kind of performing directly for the camera, directly for the audience. There's energy here. There's a concentration in the performance that kind of gives a sense of rawness and all of that highlights Mina's work, actually, on stage. Read in the light of the popular music landscape of 1950s Italy, this is something new. That doubling up of notes emphasises rhythm over lyrics. When you think about that in the kind of context of all the debates around Canzone all'Italiana versus Urlo, that firmly places Mina in the category of modern Urlo singer who appeals to a younger generation of Italians and is something almost of a threat to traditional ways of doing song. Now, once Mina's star image had been established as representing youth, unconventionality, a perceived challenge to Italian musical traditions, openness to non-Italian musics, there actually is a shift during 1959 and 1960 in how the media describe her. Yes, she's still young, but that discussion of her youth starts to get tempered by references to the adult world and through references to her family and her family values in particular. So in a way, she starts to grow up almost across 1959 and 1960. Her, her star status starts to be rehabilitated a little bit in a way that starts to nullify that challenge to tradition that she poses. There's kind of an approach almost that starts to make her safe for public consumption. I won't go into the detail, but the, the media coverage really kind of takes a specific angle here. That transition towards a more grown-up star culminates when Mina gets invited to perform at San Remo in 1960. She goes, she does okay, it's not bad. 
But then she gets invited again in 1961. Now, by that point, references to her Urlo past have basically disappeared from the media discussion about the star. And instead, she is now the favourite to win at the festival. And you can see the quote on screen here in terms of how she gets described. So this is from Tempo magazine. She is, look, the national star. She transcends ethnic prejudice. She unites the two Italys, that being the rich one, the poor one, the north and the south, the left wing and the right wing. Now, quite how she does all this kind of uniting and bringing people together. It isn't explained in the article, but that's not really the point. She isn't the kind of little jukebox girl anymore who only the teenage audience follow. Now, everybody follows her. She's the national star. She has universal appeal. She transcends divisions that might be present in Italian society and so represents something quintessentially Italian that can appeal to all listeners. Problem was, she didn't win in 1961. She might well have been the favourite, she might well have been the national star, but she didn't win. And when you watch the performance like we're going to do now, you can start to identify maybe why that was the case. Apologies as well for the quality of this clip. Um, as you can imagine, it, 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 it exists from, 50, from 61, but um, yeah, the quality is not brilliant, but hopefully you get the, the sense. I'm going to pause it there again. I think the arrangement and the performance reveal a mix of modern and traditional influences. So you've got references to Mina as an Ulatrice and references to Mina as that national star of the Canzone Italiana. You've got an, a kind of a really kind of arcing melody at the start, which showcases her talent, her ability to play with dynamics and tempo to get that emotional response from the audience. That's what you get in Canzone Italiana. But then you've got that contrast with the chorus of Bolle Mille Bolle Blu, where she blows the bubbles and elongates it and even plays with a lip. So she's playing with words here, demonstrating uh, kind of playfulness, reshaping of rhythm. That's what you get in Urlo. And the performance style is also contradictory. You've got the arm gestures to invite the audience in, but also they highlight the rhythm. And she looks directly at the camera to draw you in as well, which is kind of a really kind of modern way of performing. Now, that kind of blend of tradition and modernity, I think, goes some way to explaining the response that the song got at the festival. It was placed fifth. Italy, or at least the festival and its judges, weren't ready for a modern canzone all'italiana. And maybe that lack of uniform style to Mina's performance is maybe a result of having kind of influences from Urla and canzone all'italiana in this period. They were both important factors for Mina's star image and for the significance she held for audiences. They associated her with both song genres, but that attempt to kind of showcase both sides of her simultaneously in Mille Bolle Blu hadn't been successful. So she didn't win at San Remo and actually subsequently withdrew from Italy. She went on tour in Venezuela and Japan. She declared she was never again going to perform at the festival. And in that light, you can start to see the San Remo Festival actually as another influential medium for constructing her star persona. The star image that kind of emerges from the press coverage from the 1961 festival highlighted her modernity, her attempt to embrace tradition, her youthfulness and her challenge to society. And in a way, that performance we've just watched, I think, can be read as a performance of Italianness of that moment. Um, and that was the Italianness with which the, the Tempo article had endowed her prior to the festival. Let me explain. What I think is quintessentially Italian in her performance here is precisely this blending of modernity and continuity, of youthfulness and tradition. Because those were elements that actually characterised Italian society between kind of 58 and 61. Itali Italy in that period was undergoing change whilst resisting modernization. It was seeking to adhere to tradition whilst also embracing new ways of doing things. So maybe Mina's significance as that national star of the moment was informed not just by her links to Urlo and Canzone all'Italiana, but also to the festival. So those three mediums at the start of her career shape our understanding of her Italianness and significance as star.
She was modern and traditional. She embodied social change, but also the status quo. And all of that was given meaning thanks to the social and cultural changes taking place in Italy during that economic miracle of the late 50s and early 60s. So let's have a look then at the second case study for today, which is television advertising. This is an important medium for shaping Mina's star significance during the 60s and 70s in particular. And this is because really more and more Italians were able to access her through the TV adverts in this period. So she was the face of three well-known advertising campaigns in Italy in the 60s and 70s. And you can see the date. She, she was the face of Italian beer, then Barilla Pasta, then Tassoni Soda. Um, just to remember, though, Italian advertising in this period, um, it, it's not the television um, adverts that we're used to today. These specific advertisements that she made were part of a nightly advertising program, Carosella, which I'm sure you're aware of. That got broadcast every evening on Rai's main channel um, starting in 1957. It lasted for 10 minutes and it featured kind of sketches, recitals, cartoons, songs by well-known stars and celebrities, followed by a promotional message then for a range of products. So each segment was about two, two and a half minutes long at the most. Carosello had a big reach. It provided a moment for the family to gather together in front of the television before the children would go to bed. Um, but actually most viewers didn't turn the television on to watch it because they were already watching the news that had been on before it. So as Emma, Emma Barron explains, part of the programme's success actually came from the fact that it was positioned right in that peak viewing window of an evening. As a result, the programme was an important medium through which many Italian viewers would learn about different products, the lifestyle that these products might be associated with, and, for the case of Mina here, access their favourite stars. So appearing on Carosello meant more people had access to Mina because television was becoming more and more widespread in Italy, and you can see the viewing figures there that had gone up quite substantially by the middle of the 1960s. The other thing to think about though for Carosello is, yeah, it's an Italian cultural phenomenon, but it also functioned as advertising. And that then had an impact on Mina's status and significance. And that's because as Gillian Dyer argues, advertising actually helps us to make sense of things. It validates consumer commodities and a consumer lifestyle by associating goods with personal and social meanings and those aspirations and needs which are not fulfilled in real life. So in the context of Carosello and Mina's involvement, this power of advertising to, number one, validate a certain type of lifestyle. Number two, suggest meanings for products to individuals and society. And number three, generate aspirations. All of that power is channeled through the presence of Mina as the star in the Carosello adverts. The advertisements create a link between the product and the star, bringing glamour to the everyday and extraordinariness to the largely domestic world here of food and drink. But that product association also works both ways, as Mina's star presence brings additional meaning and status to the product she's advertising, so the products bring new significances to her star status. And that's certainly the case with Barilla Pasta. So Mina gets chosen to bring a sense of glamour, elegance and charm to the brand. Now, the brand was already established as a company with a history that represented excellence and quality. So the, the idea was bringing, kind of by bringing Mina in, um, you know, she would bring kind of her, her, her kind of already established status as being kind of a leading talent, and that would then get conferred onto the pasta. That starts to reveal what Mina has come to signify by 1965 when she starts advertising um, Barilla Pasta. And the early adverts definitely showcase and reinforce these meanings. And you get that in two ways. I'm going to talk about both. You get that through her performance and then you get that through her testimonial bit that comes after. I'm going to show you the performance um, here because they, act, I mean, it's an example one, but they, the performances largely have the same format in all the Caroselli adverts from this period. Um, she appears as the star attraction 
um, in a way that provides then the viewer some kind of intimate access to the star and her performances. And so I'm going to start this off and then I'll, I'll kind of mute it and leave it playing whilst I explain what we're seeing. So this is, I've picked this because it's my favourite, it's Se Telefonando. I'll leave her playing in the background and just kind of explain. So the settings for these performances, sometimes you get theatre stages, sometimes you get television studios, sometimes you get concert halls. Um, and then sometimes, as you can see, you get outdoor settings that showcase 1960s Italian architecture. We've got industrial warehouses. Um, she is at some point on the roof of Termini and then Fiumicino Airport in Rome. Regardless of the setting, though, you can see the way that she gets filmed. And that remains consistent, actually. The camera focuses on her. She performs for the camera, the audience, um, and, and the way it kind of captures then the facial expressions when we were up close at the start shows her hard work. And then you get the gestures as well that convey the emotion of the song. I mean, the zoom out is the kind of grandeur then of it all. The interactions that you get, look, with the camera um, make you feel as if you're watching a performance that's just for you. You feel part of the audience. Um, you kind of become a community of consumers here. You're consuming Mina first and foremost as a direct interaction, but you then are going to be kind of consuming the pasta that she's going to go on to advertise. Um, I think as well, the other thing you see there is her, her star status, her significance as that star performer, given what she's wearing. I mean, that opulent gown is quite something with the kind of perfectly styled hair and the heavy makeup it kind of reinforces that that kind of star status that she's got. In a way, the kind of gown, the gowns actually, I think, are, are kind of. They're designed to encourage us to gaze at the star who exerts a kind of fascination over us. And that is augmented then by the way the camera films her. So she's the star attraction in the first half of the advert. Then we get the testimonial, and that then is the kind of second distinct way in which her appeal as star is highlighted. In this bit, she addresses the viewer directly, and I'm going to play this for you. You've got the translation next to it. Okay, there you go. E excuse my translation, but I was doing my best there. Now, I, I'm, I, obviously that's kind of from a different period, that's kind of later into the series, 66, 67, but you can tell Mina isn't really appearing as a star in that kind of segment. She looks like a housewife. You've got a change of costume. She wears a kind of a typical everyday kind of dress. And as well, that kind of message that she gives seems to reaffirm this idea that she is a housewife. She's talking to the female viewers, definitely, and she does that in an informal way. She encourages them to prepare barilla pasta then for, for, their, you know, for your man and for your kids, she says, as a way of making their families happy. When she says there's a great cook in you, that she uses that female form again, that feminine form to address the wives and mothers in the audience. And it's as if she's one of them. She also wants to make her family happy by serving them good food. And that means serving them barilla pasta grand but actually that conceptualization of Mina as an ordinary woman a housewife can be challenged when you start to dig a little bit into Mina's private life and her established star significance by 1965. In the early 1960s Mina had come to signify a new way of being woman in the Italian context Yes, she was modern, but she also appeared to adhere to traditional social values and ideals for women. And that was largely thanks to her role on Saturday Night TV in Italy in 61, 61, 62. She was on TV, the star performer whose vocal talents and passion for music would get foregrounded. But but she she kind of would be respectable also. So kind of a, a good vehicle um, and, and, uh, for showcasing social social norms. All that changed in 1963, though, because she scandalously announced at that point that she was expecting a baby. Um, the father was Massimilio Pani. He was a married actor with whom Mina had been having an affair. And that scandal then posed a significant challenge to her respectable woman image. But the birth of the baby, Massimiliano, brought a new significance then to Mina's star status. She was a mother, respectable or otherwise. 
And what happens through the 1960s is a kind of process of rehabilitation with a focus very much on Mina as a new kind of mother. So what we've got here in the Barilla adverts is a testimonial from a new type of modern, independent woman who is confident addressing her viewers and maybe encouraging them to share her values regarding new types of families and relationships, as well as what choice of pasta to buy. Now, Mina's off-screen self and those meanings that it, it kind of had, had collected during the 1960s was all a result of, of kind of what had been happening previously. And it's present, I think, in these adverts. You know, the, there is the idea of her being respectable, the idea of her being a TV star, but the idea of her being a mother as well. You needed to know about the scandal of her relationship with Pani, the birth of her son, um, to actually realise um, quite what the promotional message was doing here. It, it was allowing viewers to, to kind of think not just about what pasta to buy, but maybe also what the role of women in Italian society in the 1960s might look like. Using Mina meant viewers were reminded of how much she had come to represent a challenge to social conventions and traditions that were accepted as endemic in Italy in this period. So to try to sum up, I've illustrated some of the many different meanings that I think Mina's come to embody during her career and how those meanings have been established. So I talked a little bit about popular music and the two genres of urlo and canzone and italiana as being fundamental in establishing her significance as that modern but traditional singer who symbolized then social change and the status quo. And what you can see on screen is, is kind of images from her early career that show how those meanings were accepted, reproduced and kind of concretized by the other mediums that she was involved with at the start of the career. You can see some film stills, album and single covers. You've got some press articles, publicity photographs, um, stills from TV performances. So they all kind of showcase how Mina is, you know, traditional and modern at the start of her career. Those images also demonstrate how those meanings circulated actually across mediums as a way of generating a star image and a set of significances at this point in her career. And I think the same is true also with those TV performances for Barilla in the 1960s. Yes, the significance here was informed by the fact that she'd become a mother in 1963. So she at this point represents a new way of being a woman in Italian society and a new conceptualization of the traditional family. It's those significances that get concretized and normalized in the adverts and then get reproduced across album and single covers like the ones you can see here. It's also clear to see the importance of these adverts, these Barilla adverts in particular, um, in establishing Mina's star image um, and also then the kind of place of family and family values in what she means. And that last image you can see there, the coloured one, um, La sua voce una pasta, I can't read the last bit. Um, that's from 2009. It's a print advert for Barilla that celebrates Mina's return to advertising for the company. She provided a voiceover for their TV campaign that year. And once again, was talking about how Barilla pasta was important for bringing the family together. So I'm hoping then what I have persuaded you of is the usefulness of thinking about the intersections and interactions of mediums when we're trying to understand Mina's star image and significance. The mediums that she's been involved with and through which the public have had access to her have together produced all those different meanings that she's come to embody. I will also acknowledge I have only really begun to scratch the surface of the many points of intersection between mediums, already established meanings and Mina. So I will conclude by saying that if you'd like to know more, I do recommend my Many Meanings of Mina book. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We want to thank you. I, of course, we can't. You can probably hear all of us who are connected but thank you this was a wonderful talk and uh, of course i know that there is at least one person in the public that is very envious of your autograph 
uh, Nicolò Salmaso certainly is very envious of the fact that you you have an autograph from Mina. So if uh, thank you, this was a wonderful talk, and I don't want to steal any time from people who may have questions. I know that they're still Friday afternoon, almost weekend, but there are still classes and things to do. So maybe students have to go away. If there is any question, could you please, if you are online, raise your hand, the electronic hand, or uh, um, speak if you are there in the classroom, if you have any question for Dr. Howard. So whilst people are thinking of questions, I will explain, uh, I will explain the autograph. So that was not me. That was, ah. a, that was a present from a final year student who, um, when, she, when she came to give me it, she said, she, she introduced it by saying, I've written to somebody about you. And I thought, oh, crumbs, has she been writing to the vice chancellor of the university, you know? And next news then, she gives me this box. I open this box and yeah. And the story goes, apparently she'd written to Mina in a beautiful Italian asking for an autograph and it included some money for postage to get it sent back. Well, a lovely letter came back, the autograph came back and so did the money. So there you go. <laughs> well, that's very nice. Do we have any questions? Yeah, Hi, Rachel. It's great to see you again, and thank you for your talk today. It was excellent. I wanted to ask if you could continue. I was sort of in, really enjoying how you moved us through the 60s and into the 70s. I was wondering if you could just, in with like brief bullet points, continue. Like, how has Mina continued to multiply? or embrace and embody some of these different meanings that you've shared with us. And then also a quick comment on her international success and presence, if, if there's anything to add about that. Yeah, no problem. I'm just jotting down the two things because otherwise I'll forget. Um, okay, so what happens kind of post set or into the 70s? Because I guess kind of the Barilla adverts are, are kind of yeah, end of the 1960s is when they finish. What kind of happens in the 1970s is um, Mina starts to withdraw a little bit from television and from adverts uh, and from kind of public performances. She does, she does fewer and fewer. Um, and the transition then that you get there is kind of 1972 at least, she, she really kind of becomes almost the, the kind of the diva figure. So she, she goes back onto television, um, Teatro Dieci, she does a series in 1972. And the story goes that she would only do it um, if she appeared for the last 20 minutes and she sang what she wanted to sing and she didn't have to talk to anybody. I mean, she, she talked to a guest, but she didn't have to do any hosting or anything like that. So the, the, there was kind of a, a shift in the kind of TV work that she'd done. And, and what she kind of becomes is almost kind of this, this kind of pop, pop music diva kind of figure. And the way that the camera films her on Teatro Dieci, she kind of films her looking up, you know, it's, it's often looking, so we, you know, as the viewer, you're kind of yeah, worshipping at the feet of the diva. Um, through the 70s, then she she gets chosen, I mean, Nicola will know this, she gets chosen to host um, Mille Luci with Raffaella Carrà. And the two together then are recreating very popular kind of variety genres. And in a way, that recreation, I think, imbues both of the stars actually with this sense of them being representative of, of Italian heritage, of the best kind of the country has to offer in terms of entertainment forms. So what you get in the 1970s is almost like this essentialized Mina who is the diva figure, but who is also the best of Italy. And that comes through then in the Tassoni adverts that she does because she's always kind of in, in, in really kind of fantastic kind of locations in terms of landscapes or she's at Tivoli Gardens for example again showcasing Italian heritage so she's she's really associated with that and then she retires at the end of the 70s and what you get then in terms of what happens out of after that is her her significance almost mediated by absence so what you get is, is other people kind of stepping into the frame a little bit and talking about what she now comes to signify in her absence. So you get the fan club, for example, telling her story and claiming 
a sense of that sense of talent, that sense of extraordinariness, you know, on Mina's behalf. Um, you'll have seen as well whenever whenever Mina is talked about on television, it's always her son who talks about her. She doesn't she doesn't do television appearances or interviews. Um, so in a way, that kind of the medium of absence is really interesting because it creates this space where fans, for example, fans on Facebook will generate their own significances of her. So it's, yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing in terms of where she is now. So much so that I've been watching, there's, there's apparently another Mina documentary on its way, which was footage of her in the studio. So keeping an eye out for that. This is the thing, she just, you know, keeps going, keeps reinventing herself. And the album covers then are demonstrations of that reinvention, that playing with what you expect, that being a mixture of all these kinds of ideas, modern and traditional being one of them, but lots of others besides. So I recommend looking at her album covers, actually. Second question. Yeah. International success, international success, international presence. So, yeah, she's um, she's got a huge fan base, I think everywhere where English isn't the native language, which possibly says a lot about, yeah, English speakers' attitudes towards popular music that isn't in English, but that's a whole other debate. Um, so yeah, so again, the period I know most about is, is kind of the 60s, um, having done a little bit of work on this. So she, she actually, the tour that she does in Japan in 1961 generates a really big fan base to the point where she's recording songs in Japanese. Um, and she is then for the Japanese media, she's kind of this sophisticated Western, you know, Italian kind of, you know, elegant star. She's also got a big fan base across Europe at this point. Um, kind of the Baltic states, Germany, the German case is really interesting because it, for Germany, she is seen as a Schlager singer. So she's this kind of exotic, foreign, kind of Mediterranean beauty, which is, you know, again, quite an odd kind of counterpoint to, to some of the other singers um, that are popular in the period. Um, she's big fan base in, in South America, Argentina as well. So yeah, she's, she kind of is, popular around the world. I have I have just discovered this week that she she went to Australia in 62, I think it is, or 63 to do a tour. So again, she's kind of performed everywhere, very, very popular everywhere. It just seems to be, yeah, the UK and the US. Although apparently the story goes, Frank Sinatra did want her to perform in the US and she turned him down because she didn't want to do the flight. So that's the story at least. <laughs> Thank you. I have a Other, please go ahead. Um, I was thinking about uh, uh, Teke Teke the, the, the show that is broadcast in Italy every summer, as a similar way to Cauzello for, for younger people to, to really see these, these stars and uh, uh, all of this nostalgia theme that we have on Italian TV. Do you think that Teke Teke Day is similar to Carosello in a way? Teke Teke Day is a collage of older TV show uh, from, from Italian TV that is shown for throughout the, the summer every year and, and after, the, after the news. Yeah, I think so. I, it's something that I've, I, I'm starting to think about a lot more because some of the work that I've done on Mina has got me into variety TV in Italy more broadly. And obviously Teke Teke Te then kind of showcases quite a lot of that TV from like the golden age of the 50s, 60s, 70s. But I think you're right. I think what that show does is kind of perpetuate the idea of precisely what I've just said, actually, the 50s, 60s, 70s as being this golden age of popular mass cultural production. Now, rightly or wrongly, I'm not going to kind of argue with, with it, but I just think that, that, that what Teke Teke Te does is it's, it's perpetuating that sense of what we were doing then was the best. The people that were doing it then were the best. So Mina kind of by default was one of the best. And you're right, I think as well, that it, it feeds that nostalgia for that moment. Um, one of the things that I really want to kind of dig into a little bit is how 
Mila Luci is a really interesting kind of object of study from the point of view of nostalgia. So that series airs in 74. Like I say, it's got Mina and Kara. It's got a host of very famous faces from the 50s, 60s, 70s. And it kind of looks nostalgically back at all of these different um, variety genres. But it does it in a way that's often quite problematic. For example, it thinks about radio but divorces um, kind of radio from the, fasc you know, the, the, the fascist period of the 20s and 30s. It kind of celebrates all of the great things that happened on radio in that period and depoliticizes it. And, and in a way, I wonder if Teke Teke Te does some of that as well. There is a really interesting thing about being nostalgic for all the best bits, but I, mean, I suppose that's what nostalgia is anyway, isn't it? It's rose tinted glasses. But yeah, I think... I think teke teke te is a really interesting phenomena that I really would like to do a little bit more work on because, um, yeah, plus it's great for just revisiting all of these fantastic stars. So, Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, two questions. One is about the uh, uh, class and the geographical upbringing of Mina. She's from Cremona, a provincial city in a way, who produced other big stars like Ugo Dognazzi. Uh, uh, I saw uh, you made this point about her, we could say the same thing about Raffaella Carrà. She tried as a figure to bring together North and South, uh, lower and upper class people. So I wanted you to elaborate more on, on her upbringing, both from the geographic point of view and uh, the, the, the social one. Uh, and then my second question is about the disappearance. Uh, Happy Guy, the you Torino, we are watching uh, uh, this documentary called uh, The Disappearance of My Mother about Benedetta Barzini, a top model uh, who grinded in those decades when Mina was also very successful. And uh, in this later stage of her year, she's now 79 years old, she really wants to disappear. She has a conflictual relationship with the camera. Uh, and uh, yeah, I see an, an affinity there with the case of Mina. What do you think psychologically is causing this desire to just vanish? Uh, is it because the show business is particularly nasty? Is it because uh, uh, there is an idea, a patriarchal idea of womanhood uh, that while the stars are aging, they cannot, uh, they cannot fit uh, uh, with anymore? Uh, so yeah, I'm curious to hear your opinion about that. Maybe also in comparison with other stars, not as influential as Mina, I don't know, Ornella Vanoni, mm -hmm. um, who else? Like, Bella, Bella. Who keep like being uh, in front of the camera until they're, they're very dead or they're, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I am conscious that if anybody does have a class that they need to go to, feel free to duck out. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so class and geographic upbringing, I think, is interesting for Mina because I think she's she's certainly upper middle class, actually. You know, her family, her her her, her father is a is an industrialist, they're very successful. And she's like you say, she's from Cremona, so she's northern Italian. And actually, I've got to be honest, I don't know that I agree with that article that claims that she brings everybody together. Because actually, I don't think she does. I think she remains throughout her career a northern, you know, middle, upper middle class woman. Which means that she has certain privileges. So, part, you know, the, 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 the scandal about the baby is maybe dealt with in a very different, in a way that you know you wouldn't get replicated for some for a woman from somewhere else, for example. There's also, I suppose, in that instance, the the kind of the lens of stardom as well and fame. But yeah, that sense of bringing people together, I'm not sure that she does. The interesting thing when you look at some of the Rye inter, um, interviews surveys that were done in the '60s, Mina apparently when you look at those surveys, is popular across the board, but with certain age groups. And it's not always the same age group in the same geographic locations. Um, so the different Rye surveys that get done in terms of who are you listening to, what do you listen to on the radio, what do you watch on television, 
it suggests there is a national following for Mina, but it's not the same. It's not, you know, everybody follows her in the same way. I also wonder as well, and this is me wondering, you know, whether she, you know, she's so popular on television, but is that precisely because television in that period is a substantially Northern Italian phenomenon? So our, what is one feeding another in that sense? So, so is it, you know, is it that we, we kind of constantly perceive her as being Northern Italian well-to-do because actually that's what television tends to showcase certainly in the early 1960s and when you get a different type of accent certainly in that period it's noticeable it's interesting you mentioned Tognazzi because when Tognazzi goes on and actually does the different accents you know you kind of go oh oh that that okay but that's not what we normally hear so yeah I, I'm yeah I'm not convinced she does bring people together necessarily but I suppose the bottom line is it possibly doesn't matter if she does or not because if people say she brings people together then actually that is what can, becomes part of the significance whether she does it or not is possibly immaterial and the disappearance yeah there's a heck there's a lot of speculation around why did she do it um she's never actually said not that i've found in interviews there have been kind of interviews that people have read into I wonder whether, you know, as it was 20 years constantly in the limelight, possibly meant, yeah, and that's enough now. Um, the thing that has happened since she's retired, in the sense that she's gone and done the projects that she's wanted and worked with the people that she's wanted to work with, you know, and released the albums that she's wanted to release, maybe suggests she left because of the desire to be free of the obligation to do certain things, be a certain way. I do think there's a very interesting thing around, yeah, the expectation for an aging female star to age a certain way, look a certain way, be a certain way. I mean, there were quite a lot of stories around, well, she, you know, she she's retired because she got fat. I I'm not going to, you know, whether she did or didn't, I don't know. But there is, I think, a lot of, of, of pressure around that. And I think the album covers demonstrate the ways in which Mina subverts that pressure because she plays with that idea of what a female star should look like. I mean, if you know her album covers, you know, she's been the Mona Lisa, she's been Julius Caesar, she's been a, you know, a Disney character, she's been a man, she's been, you know, she's had a long beard. So she plays very much with what a female star is supposed to look like anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there is. I think there's potential for thinking about that, the extent to which that was a motivation. I'm not going to speculate. I think, um, yeah. What I do think is interesting is when you look at, yeah, the way aging female stars are talked about versus the way some of the aging male stars are talked about. Celentano Morandi, for example, I think if anybody wants to do a PhD on that, that'd be really good because I think there's a lot of work to be done on that, actually. I think it's really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say something because you mentioned something about her. Uh, middle upper class but she was really upper class you know middle upper class i mean she was really upper class her father was an indo i mean her family was was wealthy wealthy lombardy family she was supposed to be born in milan she born in she was born in cremona by mistake as we know i mean they moved there but so that is something that people perceived at the time my experience when i was a child in italy and there was me now on tv was that the audience, whatever, if I was with relatives and big things, for instance, when it was Cansonissima or whatever, um, if Mina was uh, singing, everybody, people who didn't care about pop music, like my father or his generation, or people who care about, my mu about pop music, like me, would watch. Then somebody will come home, and of course, you know, especially people Celentano, and then the people of my father's generation will go away. Yeah. So 
I think he had to do because of the way she, it, there was a sense of that. But what, where I disagree with you, and I, I need to tell you this, what you, when you talk about the, the language, the accent, the different accent, actually, Italian television was very much, is what really in the 50s when he was born created, it's true that in the South, uh, you we see it also in the movie. If you see Operazione San Gennaro with Nino Manfredi, Totò, and so on and so forth, we see that people are going to see Lascia and Raddoppia with my, you know, with my Buongiorno, and they all go to bars and to restaurants to see it in Naples. So Naples is a city, and nonetheless, there are no TVs in the house, so people have to go to the to the bars to. But that was very well known to the people who were actually producing the shows, including the people who were producing the shows of Minas and the various people like Minas. And so actually um, that's the moment in which Neapolitan becomes mm -hmm. a national language because of television. Yeah. Everybody knows, everybody understands Neapolitan, even if it's difficult like the one of Massimo Troisi, that comes much later, of course. In fact, Massimo Trisi can exist in a sense linguistically because they have been Totò, Nino Taranto, Peppino De Filippo, and so on and so forth in the 1950s and 60s. That had opened up a little bit. You know, everybody it didn't matter. You couldn't speak Milanese or you couldn't speak, you know, very hard Sicilian or whatever, very strict Sicilian. You couldn't speak Sardinian. You couldn't speak Bolognese. You couldn't speak Venetian. But you could speak Neapolitan in 1965 and everybody would understand you even if they were from Trentino. So there I have to disagree about what you said in the sense that that, that was the reason for which she became. I think she became, there was a sense the way she was introduced, like the, the show, the, the one you, the, the Mille Bolle Blue, the, the, way, the way she dressed before, is those those clothes, those were the clothes that, for instance, were chosen very similar to the one that were chosen a few years later for um, for the show of L'Odissea, which was shot in 1966-1967 uh, for Penelope. So I think it was a sense of star, of, you know, the star syndrome was there, but I think he had to do actually. People knew that Eva Zanicki or Mina mm -hmm were middle upper class. Yeah. Milva and Orietta Berti were not. No. I mean, they didn't have to to say it or to know it. No. And so no. I, that, there I think is a little bit more mixed than the way you... you yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. I think that maybe the thing with the television in terms of TV sort of 50s and 60s being a northern phenomenon is I suppose if you think about the voices in the positions of authority, I suppose. So the people who are reading the news or the signorina, you know, the buonasera signorina who are introducing things, there you tend to get, you know, it, it's northern or, it, you know, it, it's it's that kind of thing. So in a, in a sense, maybe that's what I'm sort of thinking of in, in the sense of Mina maybe belonging to that kind of a authority figure within TV in that period. But um, yeah, no, I, I mean, you definitely do hear the different voices. Often the different accents tend to be the butt of a joke sometimes on the variety TV shows that she's on as well. So that's maybe another interesting thing to kind of bring in. But yeah, no, the the, the being upper middle class is, yeah. Also possibly starts to explain why she has such a meteoric rise as well, because there's money behind what she's doing, you know. And ultimately, you know, you have to have money if you're going to make it as a star. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think this, the, the thing you were saying as well about the star look, that, I mean, it's a really interesting thing that I, I haven't had a chance to go into much in the book purely because there's just so many things you can talk about. But that the Mina's look, I think, is a whole other book, actually, the way that the look changes and adapts and draws on a kind of international inspiration, but then gets kind of readapted and readopted. And yeah, so... Yeah, I, I, I'm going to describe Mina as the kind of the research gift that keeps on giving because, you know, there's always something else you can say about her. So I'm conscious of time, though, so I will stop saying things about her. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for this wonderful talk. We know it's getting late in the United, United Kingdom. And so we, we appreciate very much the effort you made and we really enjoyed very much your talk. 
we recorded it so we can look at it again if with your permission you know just for pedagogical purposes of course <laughs> of course no that is that is thank fine you. thank want... you ever so much everybody i very much appreciate it thank you dr Enjoy. howard and thank you again nicolo for having proposed dr howard to to us thank you so much this was really wonderful thank you thank you